Hello. This guided presentation explores the use of storytelling as an effective method for advancing anti-racist pedagogy in a mature learning setting. By engaging mature learners emotionally and fostering their empathy, storytelling creates opportunities for individuals to, to connect with the experiences of others and challenge their own biases. This presentation first discusses the significance of anti-racist pedagogy and the nature of mature learning, including its perceived challenges. It then highlights the power of storytelling and provides practical strategies for integrating storytelling into mature learning environments. By creating a safe and inclusive space for dialogue, utilizing various storytelling techniques, educators and trainers can effectively harness storytelling to further anti-racist education, foster empathetic communities, and advance social justice for mature learners. My name is Arwa Amubadel, and I am a racial equity consultant at MA Consultancy. I have over 12 years of experience working in higher education, and I specialize in critical and cultural theory, women and gender studies, as well as anti-racist pedagogy. I thank you for tuning in today, and I'm looking forward to engaging with you in our live question and answer session via Twitter after the presentation. This presentation will go over the importance of anti-racist pedagogy and offers a creative and engaging framework for racial literacy. I will first explain the importance of anti-racist pedagogy in mature learning settings. Then we will explore the power of storytelling in these settings and discuss practical strategies for integrating this approach, adopting innovative approaches to engaging and reflecting with the material. In recent years, and with the start of Black Lives Matter movement of 2020, there has been increasing recognition of the need to address systematic racism and promote social justice. The first step towards this goal is through education and awareness across various learning environments. A mature learning setting is one area in which individuals can be offered a unique opportunity to critically engage with systematic and societal racism. Within this setting, storytelling can be used as a pedagogical approach to advance anti-racist education. And so the scope and focus of this presentation involves two areas of pedagogy, anti-racist pedagogy and mature learners. What do we mean by anti-racist pedagogy? Uh, anti-racist pedagogy is not only about adding anti-racist content into courses and training sessions. It is also about how one teaches and reflects upon social positions in their discipline, institution, and community work. Anti-racist pedagogy is an organizing effort for institutional and social change with implications beyond teaching and training that has racial awareness and social justice at its core. Some examples of anti-racist pedagogy include incorporating the voices of racially minoritized people in the curricula, enacting anti-racism in an institution through awareness campaigns and policy changes, and fostering analytical skills on topics of race uh, and decentering hegemonic discourses. My presentation today will delve into the first and third points of anti-racist pedagogy, namely in representing racially minoritized people and learning material and introducing learners, learners to analytical skills that increase their racial awareness. This presentation is also catered to mature learners uh, and introducing an approachable and effective framework in which to tackle racial issues. What do we mean by mature learners and what are some of their perceived challenges? Mature learners are usually defined by the age in which they enter higher education. The Higher Education Statistics Authority defines mature learners as those aged 21 and above the year they enroll in an educational institution. However, this definition is delimiting because it does not factor in accruing significant life experience for mature learners. 
And that is something that we want to tap into in this presentation. Uh, and so this presentation considers mature learners to be those who have accrued significant life experience before embarking on an educational journey or literacy training. Mature learners are also not just restricted to higher education. They can also include older learners within an institution or company. Mature students also include uh, senior personnel with multi-generation knowledge and experiences. Nonetheless, there is still much that needs to be addressed in terms of diversity within mature learners. But, the, but for the purpose of this presentation, mature learners are in reference to this broad category of learners. Some barriers that mature learners face in a learning environment um, is in mainly has to do with traditional versus non-traditional ways of learning. And it's shaped by increased demands on older learners who continue education or partake in training part-time while jugg juggling many responsibilities. The motivations and needs of mature learners are also different than those than younger ones. Research by Rie and Archer shows that post-1992 mature learners within a UK higher education context strive to achieve a sense of belonging. This shows that there is a relational context to their learning and a feeling of being on the outside. Where it concerns anti-racist pedagogy, these attitudes are motivation to engage with mature learners through a relational framework, meaning that these learners can be encouraged to make cognitive and emotional connections with the learning material by creating links with their prior knowledge and attitudes. The idea is to have the learners respond to anti-racist themes through their ability to connect to and respond to the learning material. It is important to note that due to the oftentimes personal nature of storytelling, there may be different personal responses to a story or narrator. Therefore, a safe space for dialogue needs to be created before any discussions can take place. There are a few ways to do this. First, you can establish grand rules for respectful communication. Make it clear that there will be no tolerance for belittlement or ridicule. Utilize a roundtable discussion format and alternate between clockwise and anti-clockwise direction to give everyone a chance to speak if they wish to do so. After this is achieved, you can encourage active listening and empathy. Active listening means listening with the intent to understand. It involves being fully present and accepting of what you hear, leaving responses to the end when the speaker has finished talking. It also means recognizing when you are being judgmental and shifting the attitude to one of care and compassion. However, discomfort and disagreement may occur. That is part of the process and it is not unusual when discussing sensitive topics. Therefore, you will need to address discomfort and provide support when discussing sensitive issues. Remember to include trigger warnings for material that touches upon violence, self-harm, discrimination, eating disorders, or bodily dysphoria. Most importantly, examine your own ethics and try to embody an ethics of care through a love ethic. As you are dealing with mature learners, be attentive to the fact that their needs and motivations may differ. Their experience levels and backgrounds are most likely to be diverse, may even sometimes clash. So remember the following words by black feminist theorist and activist Bell Hooks. Embracing a love ethic means that we utilize all dimensions of love, care, commitment, trust, responsibility, respect, and knowledge in our everyday lives. Therefore, um, it would be a good idea to introduce your mature learners to this love ethic as part of your overall anti-racist pedagogy. Highlight the care that comes with acknowledging and empathizing with the unique challenges faced by racially marginalized individuals and communities. Cultivate a compassionate approach towards dismantling systematic and societal racism. 
provide an action plan for sustained commitment to do so, with the understanding that meaningful change requires consistent effort and action. Build trust with your mature learners and let them know that they are valued and respected. Help them understand that they are also responsible for their learning and unlearning process. Help them recognize that anti-racist learning require, requires self-reflection and an acknowledgement of personal biases. Work through a respect principle by aligning anti-racist learning with a deep respect for the dignity and humanity of all individuals, which honors the experiences and contributions of racially minoritized groups. Finally, understand that mature learners are continuing their racial literacy education or training out of a respect of knowledge. Explain that anti-racist work involves seeking and expanding knowledge about the historical and systematic roots of racism and requires actively seeking diverse perspectives and challenging one's own assumptions. By embodying these dimensions of bell hooks love ethic, mature learners can help create a more equitable and inclusive society. From this love ethic, then, we can harness the power of anti-racist story storytelling. Storytelling as an anti-racist pedagogy provides a platform for racial, racially and ethnically minoritized voices to be heard, seen, and validated. It allows them to reclaim their narratives and humanizes their experiences, which in turn helps to challenge stereotypes and fosters empathy and understanding. It further amplifies the othered perspective, providing a counter-narrative and authentic viewpoint to racialized encounters. Approaching storytelling through a love ethic also engages the heart and mind by recognizing that anti-racist education requires both emotional and intellectual engagement. Storytelling appeals to the heart by evoking emotions and personal connections, while also stimulating critical thinking and analysis. By combining the power of personal narratives with analytical thinking, Anti-racist storytelling can encourage a sense of solidarity, solidarity among learners, encouraging collective action towards a more equitable society. The importance of storytelling as a form of human connection can also be seen in the following quote introduced by educators who utilize storytelling in their teaching practice. Our lives are stories. There are stories that are told about us, told for us, and those we tell ourselves. The stories of our lives can be narratives that undermine our credibility and make it difficult to navigate the world, just as they can be vital, dynamic, unfolding landscapes of optimism and aspiration, providing a sense of place, connection to self and community, and a sense of direction. When viewed through an anti-racist lens, the significance of this passage becomes apparent. It highlights the fact that our lives are shaped by narrative, including those that are imposed upon us by others, those that are crafted on our behalf, and those that we create for ourselves. Within the context of systematic racism, these narratives can play a pivotal role. They can perpetuate harmful stereotypes, undermine our credibility and create barriers that hinder our ability to navigate the world. However, it is crucial to recognize that these narratives can also be transformative and empowering. By challenging and dismantling racist narratives, we can cultivate vibrant and inclusive stories that celebrate our experiences, foster optimism, and nurture aspirations. These revised narratives provide us with a sense of belonging cultivate a deep connection to ourselves and others, fosters community solidarity, and provides a clear sense of purpose and justice in our first pursuit of racial justice and equity. The importance of storytelling in anti-racist pedagogy can be seen in studies context conducted by experts in the field who show that teaching through storytelling modeled vulnerability 
and attended to learner's wellness, and also opened conversations about complex topics. Hence, storytelling as an anti-racist pedagogical tool in a mature learning setting um, achieves the following. It encourages emotional engagement with people's stories of their lived experiences with racism. It further evokes empathy and fosters connections with the mature learner's own lived experience and instances where they may have encountered injustice. It allows for personalization and humanizes pedagogy by helping mature learners will relate to the experiences of others. It also counteracts racist stereotypes by challenging preconceived notions and biases. It makes complex issues accessible through stories that encourage reflective responses and dialogues. While some may argue that to speak of racial storytelling is redundant, Helena Alberto argues for what Evelyn Brooks Hidgenberg calls the meta-language of race. Meta-language of race refers to the power by which race, through stories, lends meaning to expressions and terms in, bub in public discourse, as well as many aspects of human experience. And reading and hearing stories by racially minoritized individuals and groups, readers can, experiences the, can experience the emotions intended by the narrator. Stories have affective qualities and their reliance on character encourages perspective taking, meaning that the listener or reader can put themselves in the place of the character and feel what they feel. One of my favorite quotes on perspective taking and empathy through storytelling and literature uh, is from Harper Lee's novel To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, which focuses on issues of racial justice. In it, uh, a character named Atticus Finch tells his daughter, you never really understand a person until you consider things from their point of view, until you climb into their skin and walk around in it. With this quote, I include this part of the presentation. The next part will focus on one, what constitutes a story and it will introduce storytelling techniques that can be used to advance an anti-racist pedagogy. Stories for anti-racist pedagogy can be harnessed from the following. Personal narratives. The instructors or, or learners may be encouraged to share their experiences of racism or bias through a trust circle. And personal narratives can also include memoirs and documentaries. Stories can also be harnessed from case studies. And these are real life scenarios that highlight racial inequality. Uh, and in fact, one of our examples for today in the reflective exercise is such a case study. You can also use literature and films as they contain diverse texts and media that explores racism. You can also look at oral histories and engage with guest speakers who share their life experience, or you can also access oral history projects. It is recommended to alternate between different formats to meet the diverse learning styles of mature learners. You may also want to include written texts along with short video interviews or recordings of personal stories that reflect the intersectional identities of racially minoritized individuals to highlight the nuances of their experiences. But a word of caution, um, try to avoid lumping together stories according to race or socioeconomic status so that you don't fall into the pitfall of perpetuating stereotypes. Remember that the selection of the material can be a highly subjective process and there may be some oversight, so revise your material continuously. With these different source materials in mind, it's now time to think about a storytelling framework that can be used. I find the storytelling project model 
introduced by Lee Ann Bell to be an effective framework in anti-racist education within a mature learner setting. Lee Ann Bell uses this model as a scaffold for organizing curricula as well as teaching and training. Uh, the need for this model stemmed from Bell's own observations about the defenses that arise with individuals racialized as white when trying to have honest conversations about race. Bell was concerned with the inability of some learners to see whiteness and the discomfort those who were racialized as people of color had in sharing their stories. Bell wanted to open up more honest and less defensive dialogue through the story project model. Therefore, uh, her model honed in on the power in stories and the power dynamics around stories, which in turn helps ex explain how social location and racial positioning in society affect storytelling. This model is also concerned with generating new stories that account for power, privilege, and position and discussing and acting on racial and other social justice issues. Hence, the story po project model aims to promote open dialogue by exploring the power dynamics of storytelling in discussions on racial and social justice. And so, Bell proposes four story types uh, in which racial discourse can be conceptualized. These types are stock stories, concealed stories, resistance stories, and emerging transforming stories. Stock stories are the hegemonic racialized stories that circulate in the dominant culture and are generally rendered unproblematic. These stories perpetuate harmful stereotypes that can be used to justify discrimination and assume a position of universality. Acting as a contrast to stock stories, Concealed stories, on the other hand, are the counter-narratives eclipsed by what Bell points out is the white stream narrative. Although invisible to the racially dominant group, concealed stories are circulated, told, and retold by people who are marginalized or stigmatized for critiquing or talking back to the dominant narrative. These narratives often portray the cultural wealth of marginalized communities. Uh, these counter-narratives are also an effort to reclaim, reclaim the humanity of racially stigmatized individuals or communities. Narratives of resistant, uh, resistance are also counter-narratives, but they challenge the status quo and are different from concealed narratives as they are intentionally suppressed by the dominant culture for their challenging of racial injustice. They include stories of vilified individuals who have been erased by dominant history. Resistance stories also embody anti-racist perspectives and practices that have existed throughout history, and they serve as an inspiration for future anti-racist resistance. The fourth type of stories are emerging transforming stories, and they emerge out of the, the uh, previously mentioned three story types. These stories purposely challenge stock stories, build upon and advance concealed and resistant stories, and create new stories to instigate change. They envision new possibilities for inclusivity and are grounded in the racial analysis of the previous three types of stories. Le Levin's Morales describes the importance of having stories like these from an anti-racist viewpoint by saying, we must struggle to recreate the shattered knowledge of our humanity. It is in retelling stories of victimization, recasting our roles from subhuman scapegoats to beings full of dignity and courage that this becomes possible. The first sentence of this quote emphasizes, emphasizes the need to exert effort in reconstructing our understanding of human dignity and worth, which has been fragmented by oppressive systems, and in some cases, erased entirely. 
Uh, the second sentence of this quote highlights the power of reclaiming and retelling stories of victimization as it allows individuals to reclaim their agency, redefine their identities, and reshape their narratives to showcase resilience, dignity, and bravery. Through this process, oppressed peoples can begin to gather their sh shattered knowledge and reclaim their humanity. From this, the power of counter-narratives becomes apparent. And so going back to the uh, story project model, we can see that the four types of stories discussed are all interconnected, as can be seen from this diagram. Stock stories and concealed stories reflect different aspects of social life from different social positions, with stock stories reflecting hegemonic discourse and concealed stories being hidden by them. Resistance and emerging transforming stories are linked in their capacity to challenge stock stories. Uh, emerging transforming stories are further, are further built upon resistance stories and are energized by them, as you can see from the arrows. The possible trajectories of these stories also show that they have the potential to move outwards towards change, but may also fall back to stock stories. The distinction between these stories within the storytelling project model helps provide a critical lens in which to analyze stories through an anti-racist pedagogy. It is, is, it is a useful form of narrative analysis, which examines the power of stories in either advancing or dismantling racism. In the next slide, we will engage in a practical application of this model to reflect upon stories by, told by racially minoritized individuals. In the following exercise, I will introduce two anti-racist narratives. The first is from an oral history project of the Windrush generation, which is used to refer to the post-World War II immigrants to the UK from Britain's previously colonized nations. The other account is from the reflections of a racially minoritized doctor at England's National Health Service. In the first instance, practice active listening and reading with the uh, and attentive reading with the attempt of understanding and relating to what is being said and the second think through the storytelling project model to determine what kind of story is being told is it a stock story that perpetuates hegemonic thoughts is it a concealed story emerging from the shadows or is it a story of resistance or an emerging transforming story that generates its own different meanings that stem from all three. How does this story connect or challenge other types of stories within the storytelling project model? Here is one example of a personal story of an immigrant who arrived in the UK and the 1950s. So let us listen to his story together with the intent of understanding. I came here on a ship called the Ascania in 1962 from Trinidad and Tobago. And for the first time in my life, I was adrift on a sea of circumstance, having to take care of my own self. And that was a rough time for me. I had to face certain realities. And some of those were in housing. You know, the ads in the shop windows still said, no Irish, no blacks, no dogs. I think uh, laws that outlawed discrimination in public places were very important. And they came about because of the challenges that we faced as immigrants and the response that we had. You come to a place where you're looking for a house or a room to rent, it has been advertised. And the person says, 
Why not try that other place around the corner? My other tenants might object. Very sorry, uh, it's just gone, or something like that. When you hear that three or four or five times, you begin to think, no, it's not just gone. You don't want me to stay on those premises, but you're afraid to say that. So there were all these excuses that allowed racism, uh, covert racism, to go on unchallenged. Once that legislation was in place, people found it a lot harder to do what they had been doing before. I think it still went on to some degree because laws don't change the minds of the people, not immediately anyway. But when there is uh, legislation in place, people think twice and they begin to think, am I wrong? Am I doing wrong? Are these people really, are their rights being violated? Can I do something different? I have to think differently, otherwise I'll fall foul of the law. So I think that legislation changed things positively for the better. The second example is from an extract from a National Health Service doctor's lived experience of racism. I will read parts of this example and then you can pause the video to read it in more detail. The doctor says, I want to share some of my everyday experiences which have been truly harrowing. Some of my experiences are too ugly to share. I sincerely hope that what I have experienced does not remain the norm in the NHS. Individuals like me have a passion for improving stroke, stroke care for every stroke patient and their relatives. We deliver our best. One beautiful morning, I recall walking with my multicultural team into a cubicle of four patients and relatives to provide them with the best care. Imagine how it feels to hear now Brexit is happening, these people will go home. Usually it is directed at the people of color on the team who are improving patient care services by working twice as hard. It is more scarring when your white colleagues in the room are clueless, silent, or even smiling nervously. The buzzword of teamwork in such circumstances disappears into thin air. In the second slide of this example, uh, the doctor also recounts um, examples of everyday racism and microaggression that he has experienced. I'll read a couple of these examples and you can read the rest uh, by pausing the screen. When people say that you speak like a local, to this the doctor replies, it can be well intended, but it contains implied bias. Quote, you are not like other Asians around here. I wish they were all like you, end of quote. The doctor replies, believe me, this is not a compliment. If you don't like it here, you can go back to your country. This, the doctor says, was said during a conversation about the weather a junior doctor who is a third generation Nigerian. So these are but examples of some of these stories that um, an anti-racist pedagogy. And the next slides, I'll show you some reflective models you can use to engage with these examples. Step to this exercise is to adopt a reflexive, reflexive response model activate your intellectual, emotional, and creative responses to the stories. For this purpose, I recommend using a five-step reflection model, which I've developed from the work of Zelfia Wilson-Hill and their use of storytelling as anti-racist pedagogy. The focus is on five components, active listening and or attentive reading, 
reflection, feeling, creativity, and vulnerability. Active listening reading is a continuation of the previous step of paying attention with the intent of understanding. Think about the storyteller's positionality and viewpoint and the context of our two examples. Reflect on the ways in which you relate to the story being told. How does that connect to your own life experiences? Feeling has to do with your emotional response to the story you told. How do you feel towards the narrator's experience? What emotions is the narrator expressing? Are you able to relate to these emotions as well? And have you experienced or heard of similar incidents? With this emotional activation, how, how might your compassion move you to, towards social justice? The third element to this model allows you creative outlet for this for these feelings. It positions you as the storyteller and invites you to harness your creativity by expressing yourself using figurative language and imagery. So think of yourself as entering into a dialogue with the storyteller and write back to them. This way we are creating a community of solidarity. What would you imagine saying to the storyteller if you were to meet? How, how might their story inspire you towards advancing anti-racism? The fifth step is to harness your own vulnerability. If you feel comfortable in doing so, share an incident where you experienced discrimination or injustice. How did that make you feel? And how does that relate to the stories that you have heard? There are many more examples and sources that you can use for an exercise similar to the one I've introduced you to. Uh, so if you are an educator or trainer, or if you would like to uh, practice this exercise on your own, uh, think of a film, documentary, or memoir that focuses on lived experiences of racism. Uh, within a UK context, some examples may include oral histories of post World War II Caribbean migration to the United Kingdom. Extracts from memoirs and novels addressing colonialism and racism, such as Sashi Thurur's Inglorious Empire on the British Did to India, um, published in 2017. Uh, and there are also creative critical essays that combine storytelling and, and the essay form, of which one example is Nikesh Buzz's edited collection. A good immigrant. Um, with this, we come uh, to the end of our presentation, and uh, I'd like to thank you for tuning in and hope you find um, the compo components of this presentation useful for you. Uh, here are some references and further sources that you can use um, in your own anti-racist pedagogy or self-learning. I'd like to point out to you um, three projects that include um, personal stories of racism in education uh, through the Guardian section on racism uh, within schools in the UK. And then there's also the Slavery Truth Project. And for more stories like the one mentioned um, in our example, you can look at a blog post about everyday racism uh, in NHS hospitals. Uh, finally, uh, I'm looking forward to engaging with you for our live Q&A session, uh, which we will be holding through Twitter. Uh, so join me for a Q&A session on July 12th um, through the hashtag anti-racist story. And I look forward to hearing and listening from you. Thank you. If you would like to contact me, I am available on Twitter um, through at AFNBDL. 
and also um, I'm available on LinkedIn where I post on anti-racist poetry and issues of inclusivity and equity. Uh, I can also be reached by email if you have any questions or if you would like an accessible copy of this presentation. Thank you again.